lady and, and took me to Kenya the first time. And uh, so anytime I watch the movie, I think of her and all the great things she's made happen. And you know, great story, Mungari. So she she empowered 30 million women in Kenya and inspired many more all around the world to, to do things that they never expected they'd be able to do. And she lived long enough to see her grandbabies. That's not a bad not a bad life. Um, any questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, when all is said and done, how long did it take to create and finish the school? I'm going to get Brian and Carol up here in one second, too, and we'll, ask you, we'll answer a couple of film. Uh, how long did it take to what? How much money was... How much money? Time? Perfect question, because as we talk about the idea, one of the goals of the school is could we replicate this in a lot of communities all over the world? The, the real question is, you know, could we afford to? Um, a, lo a lot's happened actually at the school since the movie was completed. Actually, the this first graduating class just uh, graduated in December, and which is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, while I'm thinking about it, George Abrahams, who's the kid who the skinny kid who shot the flip video footage of the raising of the rainwater court. Turned out to be, you know, the, just an incredible. When, when I first was playing basketball with George and the kids on the dirt, and they you couldn't dribble because the ball would hit the rocks. I'm coming back to your question. The ball would fly away because it hit a rock. So they, the kids would pass instead of dribbling, which is of course the key, the, the skill that they they drill into you for years in basketball. They became, you know, it became a, a game of basketball, just passing and shooting with no dribbling and. George went from this skinny kid to this incredible athlete who really, really loves basketball. And after he graduated in December, he moved to Kampala, Uganda, where his mother is undergoing some medical treatment. And um, he's been playing as a pickup walk-on member of the uh, Kampala International uh, University basketball team. And he scored uh, 43 points in the first game of Ow. the season. <laughs> and that's a little over, it's about four and a half years since uh, since we had that first lesson. So um, it's a, you know it's a pretty exciting. I'm, I'm hoping Kampala International University is going to have the good sense to uh, offer him a scholarship and get him in school. I don't know what we're going to do otherwise, but the deal was never that we were going to put these kids through college. The deal was we're going to build a high school and then you're going to create opportunity for yourself. And George seems to be doing it the, as far as cost. So we built the rainwater court, which. Nike put about eight grand in, which was a huge first step. The eight classrooms and the two-story classroom building, library, computer lab, rebuilt the or built the kitchen and the dining hall, the science labs, which I never really at the beginning I never had any idea we were doing any of this, so I thought it was four classrooms and we were done. The community's built an amazing gardens on the school, which we've helped with a little bit. Um, they're turning out about 50 pounds of fresh greens a day, mostly kale and broccoli, but a lot of amazing fresh greens which go right into the kitchen, right into lunch every day with these kids. And my friend Steve is a chef, so he'll understand that the normal uh, corn-based uh, uh, diet in, in Kenya is really not going to cut it. And um, the greens are, are an enormous asset. Built the uh, new soccer field. We ended up rebuilding the primary school because we still had all those old mud floor or wood wall classrooms and Christina, Greg Elsner's girlfriend, designed and we, we built a two classroom preschool. So there's two years of preschool. So it goes from basically age four or five to twelfth grade. Capacity is about 800, 850 students. I think there's about 650 enrolled right now and uh, the cost was a little under a quarter million bucks which is less than one classroom cost in the US. That was the longest answer to the easiest question. <laughs> I'll do better, yes? Um, do you still go and visit? Do I still go and visit? Um, I, I, yes, I do. I love to go and visit. And um, I'm not going like five times, six times a year like I was when we were in the main part of construction. But um, right now, I, I probably won't be back till June. And I really think about that's a long time to not see the kids, but uh, there's other work going on. I've got to get back when I can. The, the school re relating to that, we have I think we have 17 or 18 other school projects in Kenya now, mostly which have come out of this. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Mutangu is overseeing most of that work for us in Kenya. So but some of those schools, all those schools, we except one, we've built water projects. So there's one that's, that's the next step up. And then 
after that we start talking about a library or they start talking to us and say what's next. So at the other schools it's more like one step at a time. Yes? Uh, I didn't see them, we didn't see them coming and going. How near to the school do they live? Well, it, and it depends. Some of them live a few hundred meters away and some of them live a long ways away. The, the, the uniform kind of answer to that is what, however far away they, li they live, they seem to leave home at whatever time it takes to arrive at school as early as they can. They leave home at first light and they leave school in time to hopefully get home before it's dark. I noticed I, one time, George is on Facebook by the way, and I noticed one time George posted, wow, I never expected to see a hyena on the way home. <laughs> Tomorrow night I'm leaving earlier. <laughs> so, but in, in some cases that's, that's you know, quite a few miles away. Um, and they come and go on foot. Yeah, they come and go. So for some of the kids, it's a 20-minute walk both directions, and for some kids, it's a, a three-and-a-half or four-hour walk both directions. Yeah. Now, when, when in the movie before this, in one piece at a time, when the education story, a lot of it was, it was primarily the water story that was featured. It was centered in Ethiopia, but some of the education work. And I've had some kids in Ethiopian high schools, where new schools, where they were really very spaced out, and they were these were schools built by our partners, uh, Glimmer of Hope in Austin. And I met kids who were walking five hours a day each way. And so most of those kids, obviously, how can you walk ten hours a day and go to school? So they would walk on Monday, and they would sleep in the classroom, and then walk home on Friday. And but that's commitment to high school. And. With or without shoes, I was just blew me away. That's probably some of what really got me thinking about the idea of filling in the gaps. If we're going to solve these education issues, so now would be a good time. Just as soon as I finish answering this question, I'm, I'm going to get uh, Carol and, and uh, Brian up here. But um, the um, the general idea is that. It's a challenge, different challenges in every place you go, but it seems to me that the universal challenges are that you, that you have to fill these gaps and sometimes it's distance between the schools. I mean, if it's, if Mahiga was 35 miles between the two neighboring high schools, well, which is absurd. And a lot of kids living in that area, you could drive through there and you wouldn't think there's a lot of kids, but they're there. But there's also gaps in the number of teachers and the number of qualified teachers and the number of teachers that are being paid by the education district and the government. And I'm primarily talking about public school funding. There's gaps in the abilities of the parents to pay tuition because primary school in a lot of areas of the developing world is free and secondary school is not. And you, it's really just about finding how could you fill the gaps? You build a school between the gaps, you train more teachers to staff those schools, and I don't know, you, that's the perfect time to get our guests up here. Could, could I get the other two panelists up here? Are you guys back there somewhere? We, oh, you're right here, one. So, and we, and we don't have to just strictly go on. We're, this is kind of more, we're, we're kind of coming from the policy section. Tell us about GCE a little bit and what, what else coming up. Sure. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm with the Global Campaign for Education in the U.S. Um, send regrets from our director, Dr. Ed Greger, who actually had a family emergency and is out on his way to Seattle today. So, I'm stepping into shoes that are hard to fill, and I'll defer a lot of the questions to these two who are much more knowledgeable and uh, qualified to be up here than myself. But uh, the Global Campaign for Education is a coalition of more than 40 organizations, um, and all of these organizations really have one common mission, and that is to ensure that uh, all children have access to universal quality education. Uh, I, our main goal is to partner organizations like Turks and like the Nobility Project um, with some of the multilateral organizations, the, which Carol runs, uh, and, and different governmental institutions that are working to ensure access to education for all children. That's like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to uh, join our campaign, uh, Ashley probably gave you a flyer when you were coming in. There's a little card you can fill out. You can also do this online. Um, and we have a Twitter, and that you're going to remind me what our Twitter is. It's at GCE G underscore, GC US. underscore US. You can follow us on Twitter as well. So if you don't want to fill out the card, you can do it online as well. So. Okay, so I have a question w with you that follows up on that, and then we'll come back to Carol. Are we still on here? Yeah. So tell me about teacher training, about number of teachers in the world. I mean, that's going to one specific yeah. area, but tell me about, uh, you know, in some ways GCE and America's relationship and how all that works. Yeah, well, we uh, work with the, the national, the International Teachers Union, which is called Education International. It's a federation of, I think, 
of over 100 teachers unions. Um, we work at the two largest teachers unions in the U.S. as well. Um, the teachers is definitely a problem, which your, your film talked about. Um, our, our global office in Johannesburg just released a report that said uh, the teacher gap, the trained teacher gap in what we need to ensure all children have access to quality education is about 1.8 million teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's not including teachers retiring or, or leaving the profession. So that's a huge gap and, and obviously that's just one of many challenges um, that, that we face in, in achieving universal quality education. And I wanted to say, you know, this film, I, one thing I love about it is that it highlights a lot of the challenges. I was taking notes uh, during the film about some of the other challenges, you know, the access to water, you're talking about infrastructure, you know, Alma Obama brings up infrastructure, and we're not just talking about classrooms, but, you know, the fact that there wasn't a paved road made building a classroom more difficult. So, you know, the teachers is an issue, but there are just a tremendous number of issues that people don't necessarily think is being linked to education that, that really are linked to it. Cool. Okay, so before I get Carol up, any, uh, another question, and we'll, oh, we have a lot of questions, we'll see you in a second. Yes. I actually have two questions, but um, I'll hit the first one. Part A? Uh, well, there's separate, there's separate questions. He'll probably be able to answer this easier. But um, why uniforms? That's uh, um, well, the I structure. Can go, I can go quickly to why uniforms. And, you know, schools here, a lot of schools what? in the U.S. moved to have had Have not, they? High okay. school students, some of them had to go home because how many of you wear, if you're still here, wear uniforms at school? Anybody go to school or wear uniforms at school? Do you like it? Not like it? What do you think? <laughs> No? So it's become, like it's actually are become lame, something. Okay. Like if they were cool uniforms, would that work? Oh, you, you got it on. Say, but, so, say, oh, there we go. Why ask a filmmaker? Ask a, ask a student. You know, the why in, in Kenya is, is interesting. And, and some of it is, yeah, it's a very complicated answer. Some of it is a question of school pride and parent pride and family pride. Like if your kid's wearing a uniform in school, you're like, my kid's in school, because there are kids that are definitely not in school. Hmm. How many how many school age, when we talk about school age, that's a reference to primary school kids up through grade eight. How many in the world not in school? Yeah, so 61 million that are out of school at the primary level. In some ways, we're looking at education issues. I want to ask Carol about this. In some ways, we're looking. We want to come up here. Carol Bellamy is, a, I introduced you before you were here. Well, if you look globally, um, and. You just heard some of the figures. In 2000, it was it was estimated there were over um, 104 million children around the world who never had any access to primary school to begin with. That's that's globally, and so there's actually been, um, if you think about it now, when we're sitting here now at 61 million, and those are the latest figures, but those are probably a year or two out of date. There's been really quite an incredible um, advancement in terms of primary school. But the really interesting thing about this movie is it was about secondary school, because what people uh, because the the global goal has been around primary school, and if you've never gone to school, that's where you need to go. You need to start with primary school. But what we've learned is that you get the you get the best results from primary school if you have an opportunity to go into secondary school. Exactly. And so the opportunity now to go into what we call here high school, but secondary school in most of the rest of the world, is really what gives you the results from the primary school in the first place. Uh, so we still have 61 million kids who haven't gone to primary school. we got to get them in. They're most, most of them are in, I'd say half of them, I shouldn't say most, but uh, about half of them are in what you would consider to be what we call in uh, the development business fragile states, but it means post-conflict or conflict, the South Sudans, the, the Democratic Republics of Congo, uh, Colum I want to do every part of the world, Colombia, um, Sri Lanka, places like that. Um, uh, but getting them into secondary schools are important. Just one thing on, on uniforms, it's not the political thing that this country has about uniforms, it has nothing to do with the politics. It really is a matter of pride, but it also has a, a little bit of a bite to it because one of the major um, initiatives that really helped very much in getting kids into primary school uh, during the last decade was doing away with school fees. There were school fees for kids coming into primary school. And the great majority of countries did away with school fees, but there are underlying fees. And the underlying fees are the cost of books and there are cost of uniforms. And frankly, if a family has a number of children they're more likely to, to and, and they're very poor, 
they are more likely to provide the uniform for the boy child than the girl child. And so mm -hmm. uniforms, mm -hmm. in their own ways, are not political, but they still have implications because the cost of the clothing uh, very often will keep still keep girls out of school. The 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 uh, I'm going to stop at this point. No, no, that's the, a, that's the, the best thing I've heard anybody say in ages. So that the, was great. The the um, the gap in terms of girls uh, in primary schools closed quite dramatically. It used to be 60 percent. Uh, it used to be still of uh, kids not in primary school. 60 percent were girls, and that's closed dramatically. But it is a huge gap of going on to secondary school. So again. I was really interested to see all the girls in your secondary school, in what you call high school, what we call high school, um, because it, it's really important because we have to make sure the girls as well as boys get an education. Sir, can I, can I ask you all a question? Yes. Um, so you, you mentioned you know, what the progress we've made since 2000. I mean, those of us who work in the development world know that one of the main reasons governments have adopted these policies is because of a set of goals called the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it's the seven goals that were adopted by almost every country around the world in 2000. Uh, one of them deals with education and calls for, by 2015, access to universal primary education and equal access for boys and girls. I'm curious um, to know, what do you think we need to do um, in the next 15 years or 30 years to, to see that same progress on the secondary level? Is it going to require a goal on, on the secondary level like we have in the primary level? Well, the problem is the goal was access. And it, it had nothing to do with any, whether anybody was learning any, anything in school. <laughs> really, quite seriously. It was all I, it, very important. I, I used to say it in health. I mean, the goal was you should be born alive. So if you're not born alive, Nothing else counts, but if you're born alive and then you become a child soldier or you're trafficked or something, that's not good. So the education goal was you should have access to school, but it had nothing to do. So the movie premiered at South by Southwest Film Festival uh, actually two years ago, so it's not a brand new movie. Um, we won the audience award at South by, which was a big boost. It's continued to play a lot of other film festivals and here and there. There's a beautiful book, a coffee table book. There's an iBook. Um, so access to all this is at nobility.org. But, so, but essentially the DVD has never been commercially available, which is just starting now. We've never really been in full distribution until this week. But we've already funded 17 school projects. So from our point of view, as a two-person nonprofit, a lot of good things are coming from the movie already. I mean, we have a lot of schools who would love to take that next step and build another classroom or a library. So in some ways, you know, we have 13,000 books actually today. We, we had. We have a container of books on a ship that went into the Suez Canal today, managed to uh, to avoid the uh, conflict <coughs> in Egypt at the entrance to the canal. So we have 13,000 books going to 12 new libraries in Kenya, and those books were donated by people in the States, and they're not just a bunch of old books they don't love anymore, that they didn't ever love, really. They're, they're favorite books that somebody chose, a lot of them by high school students and middle school students, but by adults. Who, they have personal notes written into them to the schools that they're going to. And so these kids talk about early reading. A lot of them are, are early reading books. So these kids have the ability to like pull a book off. I've noticed in the libraries that we build over there, they, the, the kids go in for the first time and it's like, wow, there's a whole wall of books. And, and much of this work started years ago when a girl was walking down a road to me in Kenya and she was waving something at me and she was with two friends and I came over with my camera and she had a piece of a book. And it, she had like one little probably signature, if you're in the printing business, 16 pages, I'd say, of, a, of, a, of an early reader book and um, maybe something meant for third, fourth, fifth graders. And she was showing me that this was her book. And literally, it was probably about 10% of what had originally been published. And she had a piece of a book, and I said, would you read to me? And I turned on my camera, and she began to read this book. And then she was looking up the cameras. The kids love the camera over there in many places. And, after a while, she was only looking at the camera and she was reading this book and I realized, well, she'd memorized all 16 pages. And that was the only book she owned, the only book her family had ever owned. And so these books were the personal notes in them. The kids go down the road and they pull one down and they read the note and they put it back and they pull one down and they read the note. And that note speaks to them that somebody wrote, hand wrote something over here. And that's the book they read. They don't go like us to the back cover and read the review or the description of the book. They want to know why somebody in the States loved that book. So. That personal connection is, it's a long story, but that personal connection, I think, is an important part of what we do and why 
the work is not just about these kids in Kenya or in the other countries that we work in, that the work is also about the people over here that are part of the project. And I keep pointing out Kat back there. Kat's song is so beautiful. Kat, what's the name of your new CD? It's called Way Down Low. Way Down Low. Way Down Low is a really cool song. you got to get Way Down Low. That song's not on it, unfortunately, because that's a one-time performance of that great Willie Nelson song in our event in Austin. But uh, that's the connection. I mean, I feel like Kat's connected to these kids. I feel like everybody who sent a book or funded a science lab, and at every level is connected. And people tell me constantly that they feel connected, that they feel the changes those kids are changing. So some of what we're talking about is not just about kids in Kenya or in the developing world. Some of it is about being connected to the world around you. And it, it doesn't have to be in East Africa. You know, we've got, we've got a lot of problems in this country as well. So some of what we're trying to do is not just education related. Some of it is about you and me. But in the very long term, I think that these results, you know, that, that these goals we talk about, universal primary education with GCE, universal secondary education, which is, I seem to be the only person who just always throws that into conversation everywhere I go, is that you have to set the goals very high, very much higher. I appreciated Carol, you saying, talking about when there's secondary education, how much better the primary is. Absolutely. Christy Pipkin, who's a really the person, the heart and soul, who connects with these kids when we're in Kenya, that Christy would constantly come back to me and say, the eighth grade girls, they just keep telling me that they didn't study. The ninth grade, when they were in eighth grade, they didn't study. They didn't pay attention. They didn't do anything in class because there was not going to be a ninth grade for them to go to. So what would be the point of learning more in the eighth grade? They were just trying to be through a school. High school's a little like that. You know, when you're in your senior year, you get senioritis, and you're like, well, if you're not going to go to college, and you're not trying to get that SAT score, and you're not trying to get onto the next level, why would you even pay attention in class in high school? And I think curriculum is another level at which one of the ones that I think is way beyond my tackling is the <coughs> idea of how difficult the curriculum is for these kids in Kenya. It's a British-based, kind of American-based curriculum. The fact that they take chemistry and English and Kiswahili just blows my mind. And we are constantly trying to teach, you know, trying to get the curriculum centered more towards job training towards creating opportunity, because some of these kids are going to go on to college. There are some George Abrahams who we hope are going to make it to college, but for the most part, high school is going to be it. They have to come out of this with the job school skills that are going to get them to the next level. So it's this learning process for them, but it's a learning process for all of us. And uh, we're going to go like a couple more questions, and then we're going to get out of here. So you did one already. How about you? Okay, um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for um, you know, this idea of education that you uh, built through the school is a really holistic view. It's not just about literacy and numeracy, and which are very important, as Carol said, but you said, you know, these kids deserve the same kind of school that kids here would have access to. And I know in, in a lot of countries that's not the case, so congratulations. Um, secondly, back to the teacher issue, um, I assume in, a, in an environment where there isn't um, a secondary school, there's probably not a lot of secondary school teachers. So. Um, did they, were they able to come in after the school district took on the school, or were there a lot of... Well, Kenya is a great example of the shortage of secondary school teachers. It, right, like, everywhere. Everywhere. And Kenya is kind of the leading light of East Africa, so for me it's good to go back there, even though we work in Uganda and Ethiopia some. But, but you know, in the case there, you know, it's very hard to determine exactly how, many, how big the teacher, teacher shortage is in Kenya. But going back to universal <coughs> primary education, it's a really long story, but in the early 90s, Kenya made free primary education. They switched, some of this is, you can tell me much more about this, but they switched back from a free primary education to a more fee-based and special fee-based kind of education system under the theory that the fees were so small that kids were going to pay, and the parents would pay for their kids, but if you have more kids, it becomes harder and harder, and massive numbers of kids dropped out of school. And after the MDG and the Millennium Development Goals, there was a massive influx of kids in Kenya in 2003 and 2004. So now it's eight years later, and those kids are now ready for high school. They came in at kindergarten and first grade, they're ready for high school, and there's a shortage of high schools and a shortage of teachers and at every level. So it's somewhere between 60,000 and God knows how many higher than that. But it's really about 
it's really about funding and what the Kenyan government can afford to spend on these teachers. So the, the, there are actually a lot of teachers who are very close to being ready or are ready who just aren't employed. There's just not enough money in the public school system to pay them all. And um, I think that the Education for All Act, is, which is coming up this April, and GCE is a big partner on that, will relate to that. But it, it's also, you know, it's, it's it, ultimately, you have a lot of students who need more teachers. And we're probably right now three or four or five teachers short of what we really need at Mahiga Hope High School. We have a lot of teachers. The Nobelli Project has found occasionally we'll find somebody who says, I want to pay for a teacher for a year, and it's a supplemental. We love that, but we're not really looking to hire all the teachers we need at the school because we don't want to, I really don't want to be in charge of running the school. It's their school. And so we're filling the gaps a little bit right now. We're still short of, short of desks, so every year we buy a few desks. We're still short of textbooks every year we fill that in. But every year we try to send less money, and I'm really talking probably less than a few thousand dollars a year at this point that's flowing from us to them in this school. Ultimately, it's about the Kenyan government and the education district being able to employ more teachers and commit more resources, and it's part of the global community. <coughs> global community's decision, and these are all about choices in education, is how much, how much are we going to gain if we're looking at the United States government to spend actual taxpayer dollars, even if you're saying in the smart way relative to how much we spend on defense or security or intelligence, and we're spending a lot of money on defense, security, and intelligence in East Africa right now, how much would we gain through spending a little bit more on teacher training or maybe even funding some teachers, and how much would the Gates Foundation yeah, and Gates is involved, and in, maybe I'll let Carol talk about what Gates does overseas and here. They don't do education. They don't do education overseas. They only do education in the U.S., so that was a pretty easy answer. <laughs> so, you know, ultimately it's, it, it's, it's about these choices. The Kenyan government, I would say very much in their defense, if you, I've seen a couple of really interesting stats lately. If you look at the percentage of GDP spent on education of the major, of the leading 125 economies of the world, Kenya speed, uh, spends the largest amount on education of any country in the world. They spend the largest percentage of GDP, which is a mind-blowing statistic. If you look at the amount they spend per pupil, they're right about 125, but they might actually drop off the chart into more 126 or 127. So they spend less per student, but more percentage of GDP than anybody else. And you know how could that be? Well, they just don't have enough GDP. Some of that's about governance, about a taxing system, about a, 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 an economy that's trying to not be a failed economy. Um, but it's not like they're not doing their part. So, complicated issue. Yes, sir. Uh, as a university educator, the thing that most impressed me about your film was the cooperation of the people in the area. Uh, the fact that they did so much of the work willing to do so much of the work is what most impressed me. Well, thanks. I mean, I think it's always good to point out that it wasn't my idea, as I say in the movie, it wasn't my idea to, to build a high school. The, um, I get a lot of people contacting us from in the U.S. We get, we get people coming aboard with great ideas and, and a great support and energy and sometimes not so great ideas. And <laughs> my least favorite of all of these is the helicopter solution which is the, the, the classic global development, which is somebody says, I'm an architect and I've designed this school and we can build them in the, I can build it in the U.S. and it only costs $35,000. We can put it on a container. It only costs $25,000 to ship it in, to Kenya. It only costs about $50,000 to get it through customs and we can, we can like pick it up with a helicopter and we can fly it out the desert. We can drop it down and boom, you got a school. And that's the kind of the extreme example, but the helicopter solution is where we come up with solutions to problems that someone else has. And the ground up, you know, my dad saying you can't you can't build a wall by starting with a, you know, you have to build a wall from, from the from the bottom. The opposite of that is to go to a community and say, I really love what you're doing and and the people here and where you're heading and tell me what it is you want to do and what are your dreams and what are your ideas. And um, that's, uh, that's what worked in this film. That's really what it's about, is the community of Mahiga. And I think if we'd been 50 miles away, some people would say, you were so lucky to find those guys. But I think if we'd have been five miles or 50 miles or 500 <coughs> miles away, we would have found exactly the same thing. That if 
you go to any community in the world and you say, tell me what are your dreams for your kids and your community, you'll get the same answer. And you'll get the same people and the same energy and the same resources and the same smarts. And um, to me, that's an actually a very inspiring lesson. So would you like to say something in conclusion? Because everything you said so far was so good. <laughs> No, you know what? It, it's a, it's universal. If you go around the world, no matter where you are, rich, poor, kid, parents want the best for their children and they want a good education. And they'll do almost anything for it. And so it's such a foundational element. It's not the only thing, but such a foundational element for everything, for, for human development, for economic growth, for stability, for for peace, more or less, because it's the opportunity for people to understand each other. So the investment in education is so crucial. And our focus has been globally so much on these primary years, uh, and uh, which is so important, again, because they're the starting years. But what was really impressive here, and I hope you take away from here, is understanding that we owe, that we don't owe anything, that a commitment to assure that the education doesn't stop at a certain point in time is really important, and is, you know, poverty doesn't mean you're stupid. I mean, it has nothing to do with how smart you are. And so, it, the investment in education <laughs> has such, I was an investment bank for seven years, the multiplier of investment in education for, for everybody, and particularly for girls, is so important. So, anyway, yeah, I, I just great, and I want to say, GC, I just want to say, for those of you who don't know about the Global Campaign for Education, they, they do a great job, and they do a great job in lobbying the U.S. government to put um, resources into education, into global education. And so, if you haven't heard about them before, go online and, and, and look up the Global Campaign for Education. Thank you. Your turn. Sure. Well, thank you, Carol. That's really nice of you to say. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the funding thing for, for one second. I have a cheap statistic that I like to use. You mentioned the, the $11 billion being the gap. Carol knows it better than I do, but I think the gap right now is actually up to $16 billion, so donors haven't quite stepped in. But that's still less than the Americans spend on ice cream every year, so that's, I like that statistic. Um, I, just to, to also to you reiterate. You still have some ice cream, don't Yeah, you? that's right. It's also less than we spend on pet food, so let's ask where our priorities are. But Although I love dogs, so I'm not criticizing. Um, just also reiterating that this is a priority everywhere. There, there's this really wonky development process going on right now to define these new set of goals. And as part of that, there was a survey done. Um, I went into I think 100 countries and asked people, "What is your priority for the next 15 years?" We're all in this. We're all in D.C. You know, deciding what the priorities are going to be for your country and development. What do you want the priorities to be? And universally, the answer was education. The number one answer in all of these countries. All of these age groups, all of these ethnic groups, all of these income groups was education. So this, the facts back up that this is this is the priority everywhere. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that and say we'll be around if you have questions for us. And I'm going to say um, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Carol. But we're going to I'm going to wrap this up. Um, Walker's Restaurant. If you want to come join us, and I highly recommend that you do. It is straight down. If you walk out the, th the front door, we came in and take a left um, to go. That's back down Barrack, Barrack, right? right. Um, to Moore. So it's a couple of blocks down. Walker's Restaurant is a lovely little Tribeca uh, neighborhood restaurant, and the back room is ours for a couple of hours. If we want to go down there and continue this conversation, and uh, we can have a beverage, we can have a bite to eat. It's a very informal after party. Um, they may, being a New York City restaurant, want us to all put all this on one tab, and we'll figure it out. You know, if you order something, we're, we'll, last time I think Mark Warren put my uh, hat out, was it you, Mark? And, and people put money in the hat for the tab, but one way or the other, we'll, we'll get that covered, and really, really appreciate everybody coming out here. Um, I think that two great things is send, some, send people to nobility.org and, and never let go of the idea that uh, 